Students, welcome to module two. In this module, we will discuss our common or shared good in the world today. In the last module, I asked you to build on your theological grammar in order to identify five core values as you begin constructing your own theological grammar for your personal framing of your public theology, which is why we read Tracy's A Social Portrait of a Public Theologian. In that text, if you'll recall, the Tracy text, we learned how your context as a publicly theological presence will always take up residence in at least these three publics, these being the religious community, society's manifold contexts, and those institutions that arbitrate relevant public discourse in the world, be they universities, state houses, local community centers, and more. From the moment human beings began to publicly argue about the good of the polis, or the community. We've been engaged in a particular form of oration, and the art of that form of oration as an act of persuasion for the good of the community is tangible in an example from the classical Roman period at the rostra. The rostra was a public forum by which members of the polis, that is the early city-state or community adopted by the Greeks, would orate to the crowd. Now, the rostra was a platform at the center of municipal life. Following its name's stake, the rostra was lined with the rams of enemy warships, which were captured during the Roman victory of Antium in 338 BCE. The rams were hacked off and repositioned on poles alongside the speaking platform. Now, imagine yourself with the circus Maximus to your back and the gleaming marble Colosseum before you. You lean into the wind with the rams of ships peeling back the tides and cutting a course through waves of the public. Oration happens here, even as the lungs of the Colosseum before you rise and fall with the masses watching the carnage for sport. Public oration hasn't changed that much to our own day. Deception, coercion, and lying were always mixed with the virtues of trust, honesty, and forthrightness. The public square is a complex mirror of our humanity. Remember that. Public theology is equally complex. Theology, when engaged in the public square, must lean in to be persuasive to today's discourse on matters of immigration, the election of a president, the corrosive qualities of religion co-opted in violent expressions around the world, for instance. Public theological oration is still about speaking through the hacked off vowels of adversity and conflict in order to reach humanity with a word of hope. In terms of the values then, public theology is always first and foremost about the value of hope, or gospel hope in this case, as hope actualized for the sake of the whole world, beginning with those people right there on the other side of what hacks them off. Today, we often overemphasize reaching consensus, which is often taken as a kind of leading postmodern liberal progressive value, as though getting along and appreciating difference is the equivalent to seeking a deeper understanding and being loving toward one another. I want to encourage you to seek deeper meaning beyond pastoral appreciation and tidy consensus. The big ideas that change the world were worth fighting for, where a lot of people disagree. In this way, conflict, dissonance, disagreement, these are all healthy for our shared public good. Not every disagreement is a percolator for tomorrow's violence. And only in addressing what's ailing us, like racism, misogyny, hopelessness, and more, will society grow. As a public theologian, I'd suggest that one of your first prevailing values is to appreciate conflict, and another is to be resilient. For instance, consider the Apostle Paul who was just such an orator, born into the first century Roman rule, eventually executed for both what he said and who he was as a Roman citizen, with the blade piercing his back at the shoulder blades. Public theologians who are prophets may get executed or assassinated, and we should consider this the next time mainline Protestants claim that we should be, quote unquote, be more prophetic, forget consensus as a first public value, and lean in on Paul's example. Consider this, 
As a public theologian, Paul wrote his epistles in Asia Minor, before a canon of the New Testament, and even before these first books were even drafted. I imagine Paul drafting his letters in the evening by oil lamp with partial parchments of the early gospel accounts strewn on the ground or on his bed as he wrote out on the parchment a response to a specific pastoral concern as a response that was typically connected to a non-mission critical argument in one uh, of, or the other of the early house churches. Public theology for Paul was about turning mundane arguments into opportunities to speak about the gospel. You're arguing again? But you're all members of one body, etc. Here comes the image of the body. See what I mean? As a public theologian, follow Paul and ask, what is my purpose and who is my audience? Paul's purpose was to provide a new eschatological cosmology, a new worldview grounded in hope. And his audience was the contextually diverse early Christian community throughout Asia Minor and Rome. Now, some of these early Christian communities were as diverse as you might imagine even as we often undervalue these differences by lumping them all as small communities within the Roman Empire. In truth, Ephesus and Corinth were as unique from one another as Rome to Jerusalem. Now, now here's how Paul crafted an oration in the new cosmology grounded in Christ. For Paul, the new citizen in Christ was comparably more than a member of the city-state or the polis. Rather, the citizenship of all social and political relationships were grounded in Christ and drew on a broad transformative image of the citizenry or the citizen within a shared body and engaged in an epic story of hope. This is the eschatological cosmology bit. In terms of audience, for Paul, participation in Christ's body transcended the specific of political allegiance, even allegiance to the seemingly unimpeachable power of the Roman Empire. And it meant that the early Christian community was in fact an epiphenomenal resident alien or refugee from the world, participating now together every day in an economy or oikos of a new set of relationships, a new body, or what came to be understood or identified in medieval theology as the corpus mysticum of Christ. In his cosmology, Paul invoked images of this new body, of a new spiritual household, where all members of the corpus mysticum were a spiritual stone stacked one atop another within the living household of God. Or he referred to the early communities as a series of interwoven vines cut from the severity of one cosmology and grafted onto another cosmology, in which Paul invokes the vitalistic, hope-giving tree of life itself, the purpose of a new or emerging cosmology was key for the early Christian oration through Paul and his narrative poetics aligned to the needs of the audience or the communities before him were precisely why he was so effective. Paul spoke with image and story to spark the imagination through new metaphorical flint. He called forth a Christian cosmology that is still ours today. Now that is effective public theology. You could preach this. Yes, you are an alien to this foreign cosmology. Yes, you are displaced in the world, but you are a constitutive member in the oikonomia, or the household of God, placed together like stone on stone, or stitched as the seams of the body grafted into a new world founded on divine hope and God's plan for you through Christ. Do you see how even today your public theological voice inherits its grammatical framing from Pauline prose? Do you have an explicit or operational rationale which we would call an apologia, comparable to Paul's? Now, an apologia is nothing more than the case you make for the plan of the sacred or God in the world or in society. So like Paul, a strong apologia, again, your case for God in society, will begin at the grade of God's hope for the world, or what we would call an eschatological cosmology. Now, what is the cosmology that informs your apologia? Consider that as I go for a moment to a bit of history in order to answer this question a bit of cosmology. It wasn't until Augustine and his classic city of God that a mature theology emerges after Paul that merges the two cities within his cosmology 
of God and humanity, the city of God and the city of humanity, which become the conceptual roots of a rift much later between things of the spirit and things of matter, or what the early modern period, much later, I should say, identified as church and state or religion and government. Still, for Augustine, the two cities of God never fully were outside of the purview of God's providence, which would beg the question in early modernity about the relationship between the city of humanity, which includes the governance of society, and the city of God, which involves the ordering of vocation within society and within God's providential design and ultimately the heavenly city itself. For our current purposes, I'm going to fast forward now a bit to the 16th century, where public discourse takes place regarding the proper relationship between the ordering of government and religion, and reveals a major influence on public theology today. It begins with Niccolo Machiavelli, a political philosopher and advisor to the Italian Medici family, who is also, I should say, the spitting image of my college roommate, but that's a different story. Machiavelli made his case that the state or the prince can use coercion in order to order the auspices of public life. And insofar as religion is at the service of the prince or the state, religion therefore can be utilized as part of the coercive arm of the state. That is to say, a lie made by religion for the sake of the state is not a vice, but may well be a necessity and a virtue of good governance. Think of hegemonic powers or global ideologies of transnational boundaries today, which use religion as a foil for justifying violence. And you'll sense how these legitimate forms of violence, the state or post-state actors through the auspices of religion, actually get grounded. In short, for Machiavelli, religion can be co-opted by the auspices of the state, legitimately, which is necessary for regulating against avarice and ambition of the human being for Machiavelli. For Martin Luther, 16th century, who was a contemporary Machiavelli, he was an Augustinian friar. In his sense, the Christian is free to serve in both the auspices of the church and the state, both of the Augustinian cities, I should say, because both were always and ever within the proper realm of God's providential design in the world. The Reformation placed an emphasis upon the human conscience free in response to the divine so in short, your conscience must be guided by scripture in the believing community, um, attentive to the mediating power of Christ in the world, etc. Now for the trained lawyer, John Calvin, the conscience of the good citizen can be sanctified daily and continuously, of course, with the betterment or purification of one's soul. So for both Luther and Calvin, who have immense impact, like Machiavelli on modernity, the church and the state or religion and society are always participating in acts of cooperation. I should say that both Luther and Calvin found the separatist leanings of the Anabaptists, today's Mennonites, Anab or Church of the Brethren, Quakers, etc., who separated their piety um, in order to participate, not participate in the earthly city. I mean, Luther and Calvin saw this as a shirking of one's societal responsibility. You must participate, they would suggest where religion and the state must be cooperative for the common good. There's that phrase. So is one of our highest core values the common good? Well, depends on what you mean by the common good and how you understand after modernity the proper relationship between religion and society or church and state. I mean, Machiavelli and Luther are two very different ideas of the common good and how they understood the coercion of religion. After all, whose common good are we talking about? Is it determined by the state or the church? What is the Christian vision of the common good? It's different for Mennonites, Lutherans, Calvinists, and Machiavellians for that matter, who will view this as unique for one another. Is the common good a secular concern only? Can religious values inform the common good? Or is this always a societal imposition? I mean, it depends on how you understand the relationship between religion and society. If as a public theologian, you speak from the position of a clear eschatological cosmology, hope for the world, as it were, you'll need an equally clear understanding of the societal audience for whom you believe that good is your concern. My experience tells me that you do not win hearts and minds by appealing to the common good as public theologians. Theology wins hearts and minds by appealing to a worldview that is grounded in hope, 
and that envisions a future with the participation of an audience and that of their children, and that is the public. I think of my Irish great-great-grandparents who came to the United States during the potato famine. They had twin boys with them. Now, both of these ancestors were exhausted even before they stepped aboard the ship to take them across the Atlantic. Both of them, in effect, perished on the journey, first her and then him, before their bodies were lowered into the deep blue water. Their twin boys were deposited on the docks of Baltimore Harbor, six years old and unaware of the danger that they were in, which was certainly the last great fear of their parents, I'm sure. Stories, Pauline-like stories, help tell the story of our human plight, and it must end beyond the power of human loss. We must know the end of the story so we can connect it to the grammatics of hope. In this case, the harbor doctor and his wife raised these two boys as their own, an unflinching gesture of generosity and kindness to immigrant children and a silent promise to their deceased parents. Today, my twin sister and I owe our lives to the unflinching generosity of the harbor doctor and his wife to this couple, and their names continue in our family to this day. In scriptural form, Abraham and Sarah had descendants like the stars, it's also the case that acts of generosity can have descendants like the stars, too. Can you, as a public theologian, speak about immigration as, as part of our country's birthright and utilize powerfully symbolic imagery to instill courage, possibility, hope, and a viable future in story form? Think of your core values and ask yourself how these line up with your sense of purpose and audience and story and especially your assumptive sets for the commons or the good. Part of our work as public theologians is to get above the waterline of our own ignorance. This not being just what we don't know, but rather what we don't know, we don't know. Modesty of the self and determination toward the public do go hand in hand as core values too. In our readings today, you will hear much by way of the themes I'm identifying, but I want to focus on our interpretation of the common good because this one gets us into trouble when we apply our values. In the history of local and national contexts, appeals to the common good are often, believe it or not, a tool for segregation. And in the U.S., for instance, after years of working between historic white and black denominations, in my capacity in the ELCA, segregated worldviews remain with us Today, I saw it as you know it today. Raphael Warnock's work for this class will assist us for deepening our understanding of both segregation and a potential shared common good. Do Christians from diverse ethnic and racial communities share in a single corpus mysticum? Do we have a shared apologia? Our writers help us to see that in the midst of what we share, we also have misunderstood often how piety and liberationist strands in contextual form from specific localities to express liberation, we'll do so in liberal ways. It's part of our commons, yes, but it's complicated. In the Table Talk and Back to the Table, we'll be assessing together the Christian life and the common good, which is the title for this module. Do the readings, go to the Table Talk for your first compound question. It's a privilege to do this work with you. It's that, isn't it, for all of us. Let's explore these themes together. I'll see you soon.